I'm back with uh, Mr. Gombeski, or Ski, as he's commonly called. And we're just talking about his uh, first time training with uh, his team out in the field. So what was that like, your first like field training with the with your team now? It it was it's good because we spent you know, geez like four or five weeks, uh, just out in Nevada just training and and we got to spend a lot of time together, like away from the company and just out in the the maneuver areas where nobody could bother us and we could just work on you know basic small team tactics, uh, and just just get to know the guys you know, you know Philip. <laughs> Have the GMV, take the GMV, swing by a gas station, pick up you know a couple of cases of beer, go go find go find some you know dilapidated building on some faraway uh, you know impact area, and then you know have a bonfire and start drinking some beers with the guys. Uh, it was just a good time. It was it was a great time to to get to know each other uh, before deploying. Did you get a chance to show off your sweet J tacking skills to them, or did you not have any aircraft? Uh, not not to that point because because the the J tac training and and stuff that we were doing is was consolidated. So they would basically say, "Hey, all J tacs come here, and then we're going to go to the the impact area together," uh, because we you know we had to utilize. I got to save that make, money. Well, we had to make the most of the aircraft that we could get. Right. By bringing all the guys together. How many uh, how many field trainings did you did you get to do with your team before you before you deployed? Jeez, a lot. A lot. A lot. And then we go through the shoot package and like basic demoing and all sorts of crap. Did we, you get to do any uh, like kill houses, like close quarter stuff? Yeah, the shoot houses. So when you right. go through the shoot package, it's it's all that stuff. That sounds like fun. It's it's a lot. It's you'll shoot thousands and thousands of rounds uh, well, before like you dream. before you even deploy um so you shoot packages you do basic demo courses like what kind of courses like did you do personally uh we do some intel stuff uh we also do you know some basic cultural language uh and then we spend some time doing a little bit of cross training so you know learning to make breaching charges Things like that. We cross train on all the weapon systems. Uh, we even cross train, you know, some of the the uh, the operators to be controllers, you know, if, if if need be, like make sure they have a basic understanding of like how to talk to aircraft for an absolute uh, emergency situation. Yeah, so for, so doing oof. like ECAST and stuff like that. And then your then your all your other stuff. So your your comms and your satcom and. And how to set up a beacon and all this other stuff, all all the stuff you would need to 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 be able to go as a self-sustaining team, and you know, living out away from company. Right. How how much would you say like in months did you spend training before you got to deploy? To oh, the the workup. So the uh, January, probably about eight months. Eight months. Wow, eight months yeah. of training to work up to it, huh? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, a and, lot. And, and 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 it's a, and it's a cycle, you know. It's a cycle, and every time every time you deploy, you go through a workup. Sometimes the workups are rougher than the deployments. Uh, that that can be said, like especially if you're uh, if you deploy on the MUs, uh, the just the workups to get qualified to to go with the MU is worse than the deployment is. Wow, that's. That's yeah, a, a it's, lot it's of ridiculous. Training. Um, so let's you know fast forward through the the months and months of training. You're finally get the word that you're shipping out to Afghanistan. You know the thing you've been, you know, obviously wanting to do. So that's why you enlisted. Uh, what was that like to be like finally, I get to go. Uh. First of all, it was the first time I ever deployed, and the flight there or the the trip there didn't suck because the, our team got our own C-17, so we were able to like put all of our gear on it, all of our vehicles, and then fly from you know North Carolina. Uh, hell, we landed in Afghanistan in Herat like 16 hours later. Wow! After leaving uh, North Carolina. So you flew, I'm it assuming, was... east over to Europe, refuel somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think we stopped in Germany. And, uh, 
yeah, when we landed there, they offloaded our GMVs. We started, you know, putting the gear up on them, and we broke out a couple of cases of ammo and loaded our weapons because we had to drive down to Camp Stone, which was down the road. So, you know, we were already on the road with weapons, you know, less than 20 hours after leaving the U.S. Jesus. Yeah, so it was not like, a lot of time for you like, to sleep, huh? No, it was, it was just right into it, and you know, it was just awesome, you know, awesome rolling with the team. What was it like when you like stepped off the plane? You're like, this is Afghanistan. Like, what was your first impression uh, of I mean, Afghanistan? I, this this is my fifth deployment, so the whole the whole wow, this is a new place factor was kind of it had <laughs> it had run its course. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just it, it 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 felt good to actually be back like in country. Uh, someplace other than Iraq. Right. Um, so, let's say you go down to Camp Stone, obviously, then you get your your order to go to uh, BMG. Yep, we were there uh, at Camp Stone for, I think, we're, we're about two weeks was, was our turnover time and, and prep time and, and waiting for the rest of the company to show up. Uh, and then you know, we've got the final word on which teams were going to which areas. Uh, and then, you know, we just started getting it all together and figuring out what we needed to take with us and, you know, figuring out the route we're going to take and start looking at, you know, maps and stuff and figure out what we're going to do when we get there. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to give, you know, delve too much into your Afghanistan deployment. Obviously, you've written two books about it. Um, you go into a lot of it, so I guess to, to summarize it, so you get to you get to Fob Todd, right? And those are the five you you eventually had to drive the mountains through. Um, yep. I remember in your book you saying you had to you were in a convoy and the it was an army lieutenant who had no idea how to convoy, <laughs> something like that. Yep, yep. There was a young lieutenant uh, <laughs> that had you know it, by no fault of his own. I mean somebody put him in that position. And a lot of those H and S guys with the army, I mean, they're just they, especially for the convoys and stuff, they just pull people from, you know, hey, two personnel guys, you're gonna go, you know, man, two forties in the turrets and stuff. So they're they're kind of like a ragtag little unit that's put together. But yeah, they had never been out there, so uh, actually none of us had ever been out there in, in the convoy. So it was quite. I think it was like 180 kilometers. That's uh, it's quite a drive. Yeah, it, it it I think it took us like five days or something to get there. Jesus, it was a five days straight, or did you guys manage to? No, camp we at all? we had stopped at different places, and we were we were running into issues left and right. Mechanical issues, or just like mechanical issues, issues, or... issues with the 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 local national contract drivers. Oh yeah, of course. Just 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 being straight fucking lost. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was it was quite it was quite a it was quite a venture. I don't want to you know give too much away. You know, if people people should really read your books, obviously, um, and I don't want to give away your your whole story of your time in, in Afghanistan. So uh, let's push to to the end of your your deployment in Afghanistan. Um, you end your deployment in Afghanistan, and uh, then what do you do from there? Came home. Uh, was home for about two months. Maybe maybe two and a half, and then uh, that was it. It was I was I'm out, man. I'm leaving, cause I I when I was done with that deployment, when I came home, I was I was contempt. I was like, okay, I I did exactly what I wanted to do, and I'm sure your wife was happy I'm, to hear that. Yeah yeah, I'm like I'm, I'm I'm done, and you know they they wanted to they wanted to send me to the schoolhouse to be an instructor a JTAC instructor, and I was like uh, I'd kind of. I never met. I, I I knew I was never. I knew I wasn't going to stay in the military. Uh, I knew that from the beginning. So it was kind of like that point where, okay, eight years, I can go sit at a schoolhouse for four years, but that's I really don't want to do that because that's not why I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, or I could just be done with it and go home. I mean, I was I was content with what I had done. You know, five deployments. Uh, so I I was good. I was good. Uh, you know, the Marine Corps was done with me, and I would I was done with them. Yeah, happy happy splitting. It was a mutual happy splitting of the relationship. Yeah, it was just time to move on, man. Right. And and the whole the whole deal with the the way the war was going, and right. and the rules of engagement, and just just yeah. the, the 
the whole so app. That's all chronicled, and, uh, and I don't know, Dagger Two Two. You go into that quite a bit about. Yeah, it was just the, it was just ROE time and everything like that. Yeah, the, I mean, all the all the warning signs were there. It was just time to leave. Right. Um. So I guess the follow-up is, uh, what made you sit down and, and want to write about your your stories and your time in Afghanistan? Honestly, I I had. You know, towards the end of the deployment, it, it was kind of one of those things where I was like, man, this is what what happened here with, with all these people and, and you know, all these all these great guys I got to work with. I'm like, like this, is, this could actually be a story. And I just kind of pondered it for a little bit. And, and you know, we, I, I used to joke around with, with, with the team saying, yeah, you know, if we all – if we all live through this and survive, maybe maybe I'll write a book one day about it. It was kind of like a joke. Were, were you much of a writer before you joined the Marine Corps? No, no, not at all, man. I'm the last person you would think would ever be a writer. <laughs> uh, but then you know, it it just happened. You know, uh, yeah, it just it just kind it just kind of came about where you know I started putting pen to paper and started writing a story, and and the more I wrote it, the more I saw that it was a really good story and then it, it just kind of took off from there i just stuck with it and it kind of became my thing where i was going to take that joke about writing a book and actually write a book uh, what was it like like i guess the difficulties of you know trying to find a publisher trying to get people on board like did you have difficulty trying to get people to come together for you to uh, help you i actually I, I lucked out man like people people will ask me okay you you've written two books like like how do you go about it? Did you like, did you get a, a you know an agent or something in the beginning? And well, I didn't do any of that. Like the normal route that you take to get a book published or get a book deal, like I didn't do any of that stuff. I just it just happened through like word of mouth, where I knew somebody who knew somebody who wrote a book, and you know emails got passed around, and then one day I had a I had an email sitting in my inbox from. Uh, from the editor at St. Martin's Press saying, hey, I've heard about, heard you're working on a book about MARSOC and just wanted to find out if you know if you've signed any contracts with anyone. And I was like, nope. <laughs> and he emailed me back. He's like, okay, well, don't. Let me send you some stuff to take a look at. I'm like, okay. And then that was it. Wow. So that's, when people ask me like how, like, like how to get a book published and stuff, I'm like, don't ask me because <laughs> I didn't do it the way it's supposed to be done. Uh, so that was the first book. Was the second book? Was that easier for you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The first, the first book was it, it was a growing pain, and and a lot of that had to do with just learning the the business, the the publishing business, and how books are actually you know written, edited, blah blah blah, all that stuff. But so by the time that the second book was the second book was was actually more enjoyable to write because I didn't have to worry about anything else except just writing the story. Right. Uh, do you have any plans to write any more books or you know about maybe no. Iraq or anything like that? Or no. You, you done? No. Nope. I'm a I'm a one trick pony. Well, two tricks. Uh, two trick. Well, yeah, two books. But you know that I just wanted to tell that story. I mean, but I don't know. Maybe maybe one day, but definitely definitely nothing. It it would have to be a story that. You know, like th this one that I wrote. Uh, I mean, it would have to be something that I could totally be behind. Uh, so just to write, just to be a writer, nah, that that doesn't do it for me. You thought about contacting, uh, you know, HBO, get yourself a miniseries like General uh, Kale? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, listen, who would you have play you? Who do you think? Oh my God. Uh, I have. <laughs> I have no idea. You've never put any thought in this? I would put thought into it. No. Uh, no. Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's HBO's problem. You just give them the script. Yeah, I just I just give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, all right, so now, I mean, now that you're out of the Marine Corps, you got the books published, what is it that you, I don't know, I, I know I know what you do, but, uh, you know, what's life for you like now? Uh, I'm just I'm just a normal guy, man. I just I live in Colorado now and I I go to work and I teach and I come home and I go snowboarding and I enjoy camping and backpacking and all those things man it's just I just normal life man it's 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 more than enough for me Do you uh do you use things like airsoft and the uh, like the Army 3 Milsim unit that that we're a part of to 
scratch an itch for you, or is it just something fun? Yeah, uh, a little bit. I, with the with the with the airsoft, so the the Milsim airsoft stuff. It, there's a huge like veterans community in, in it, uh, which is really great for camaraderie. I don't know if you want to plug uh, them or not. Which group you're a part of? Uh, well, no, I I I've done it with a uh, a bunch of different groups, but you know, just just that in general, it's just a good it's a good activity. I mean, it's 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 a hobby. It's it's something fun to do. Uh, you know, just just as fun as taking up, I don't know, freaking mountain biking or something. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel. Except like, that when I, get I personally to shoot kids in the face with little right, pellets. Right. That's kind of how I feel personally, like because I do airsoft too now. And um, I go shooting at the range, and I'm like, this is just something fun for me to do. Like, people who like race car driving and drag racing, I'm like... I'm yeah, just, it's just, just it's a fun and hobby, just, and, and, it, and if, you, if you go to, like, so... You know, there's a bunch of us that go to, like, you know, the same event every year, so right. we just... You know, it, it just becomes like a club, man. What about the uh, video games? What made you get into, into gaming? I was always into, like, simulations and things like that. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, my job now, I work with with simulators uh so that kind of branched into you know working with military simulators to kind of i never really was a gamer so kind of venturing out there and just you know just looking to see what's out there on like the commercial end of uh simulations and then obviously you know arma that's like the the, the apex of of, yeah that's the apex and then and then once you start getting into it you you start seeing how uh, you know, it's really cool that it's it's an open world where the the software's like not locked down, where there's a whole community of people that just create stuff. So not not only is it uh, you know an awesome avenue for you know people that are into that type of gaming, but also people that are super creative and like developers and you know just wanting to know you know being able to look behind the curtains of how some of these great. Uh, you know, multi role player games actually work and are built and structured. Right. Yeah, I find it you find a very interesting mix of people and in, uh in groups such as these. Um you'll you'll find some, you know, really smart people, people who are, you know, geniuses and some Oh absolutely. Like you need all sorts of people, man. Yeah. Um so do you want to move on to our, our Q and A section here? I actually have a, oh, some questions people want yeah. to ask you. Uh, yeah, the let's first do one. It. Is actually from uh, Captain Cardinal himself, who who wants to know: uh, boxers or briefs? Silkies. Silkies, nice. Yes. Love it. Boxers or briefs? Come <laughs> on, man. If you're not wearing silkies, you're you're effing wrong. Uh, I have somebody asks here: What's your favorite beer? Oh, it depends. Honestly, like I love all beer, but you know, there's there's like good beers for like summertime. You know, in the wintertime, it's heavier beers. Since I live in Colorado, we just have so much selection of, like, really good microbrew beer. But I'd, I'd have to say one of my favorite ones is is an IPA called River Runner. It's made by a brewery in Buena Vista, Colorado, called uh, Eddie Line. Hmm. It's delicious. Is that, like, your go-to? Like, you come home, you're like, oh, I want a beer tonight. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my like like I'm going snowboarding. Like when I go snowboarding, I I get those beers for the house. Gotcha. And they only come in tall cans. Uh, let's see. I have uh, oh, uh, Mr. Captain Pepperman asking uh, once once he moves to Colorado, are you gonna play airsoft with him? That's what Pepperman wants to know. Is he moving to Colorado? Uh, I think he's moving to Colorado and, Springs. Is what it looks it, like. It all depends. I only play with cool people. <laughs> oh, well, then in that case, definitely not him. <laughs> no, if you, I, like I play, uh, so the big group around here in Colorado is Titan Milsim, which, which I know, I know uh, uh, the owner and great bunch of guys, uh, but they have the bigger events here in Colorado. So, yeah, I, I definitely go. That's, that's one of the annual ones that, that we go to. Uh, I have somebody asking, what do you think about smaller nations, other than Great Britain, uh, contributions to the coalition there in Afghanistan, I'm assuming? Uh, from your experience, what country stands out and stepped up more than others? Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, so Afghanistan, I mean, there's, it's, there's, in different regions, there's different countries. 
So I was in RC West or Regional Command West, which was uh, who was in charge of RC West. The Spaniards were in charge of it. And then the other, com the other countries that were working there were the Italians and the U.S. So depending on where you're at in Afghanistan, you'll have different exposure to different countries. Uh, but like we, we lived with the Italian army and those guys, they were just, they were awesome. I mean, it's, it's different when, when you're out in remote areas and you actually have to like live together and you rely on each other for like just basic survival. Uh, that and the Italians always had boxed wine and they made their own little brick oven to make bread. <laughs> So so God so God bless the Italians. Uh, the follow-up question he has here is: What is the professional experience some uh, U.S. Marine about such as yourself feel about those nation's troops and their training equipment? Is it something that you just brush aside, or is it something that ever really springs to mind, or is it something you think about? Uh, no, because I, I I mean, I mean you have to gauge a person on their merits, right? Right. So I, I, I've been I've been next to, you know, US soldiers that have like locked up and like froze under fire. Uh then I've also fought alongside of Italians that are just, you know, gun ho and even even uh like Afghan army. Some of those guys are absolutely incredible. Some but the vast majority of them suck. But you know, there's there's onesies and twosies that are good, so you really can't just do a, a, a broad brush on that. I mean, you, you kind of got to take people at, at their worth. Oh, I completely understand, you know, agree with you on that one. I mean, there's different people in all crowds, you know what I mean? Just because somebody's from this military doesn't mean that they have the capability yeah, to... Yeah, that, do that doesn't mean shit. Yeah. Um, I have somebody here asking, what do you think about the uh, Army Airborne Infantry from a former 11B Airborne? The 80 Deuce? Uh, he doesn't, he didn't yeah. specify. Uh, yeah, so Army Air, so Army Airborne. So, I mean, we were, uh, you know, we lived at Fob Todd with uh, uh, the 82nd Airborne. Some of my best friends are paratroopers. Uh, those guys, I mean, that's that's America's that's America's unit. Uh, you know, we fought alongside those guys. You know, cleared buildings and and gotten tons of firefights. You know, shoulder to shoulder with those guys. And just like you know, just like with the any other nation. Uh, those guys, as a whole, I mean, we're, we're they're just good war fighters. Uh, you know, they they had to occupy most of the combat outposts, so so oh, even the more remote, in the middle of nowhere, nobody yeah, the to more be remote at. areas. I mean, it's that's that's like that's like the shittiest job in yeah. Afghanistan. Uh, but those guys did it, and they did it well. Uh, yeah, I got I got a lot of good friends that are paratroopers. From that deployment. Uh, this one's from uh, Matrix. Uh, how was it at first transitioning back to civilian life? It's hard. It's uh, you know depending on 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 how gradual your outing is from the military. You know, for me, I just I went into work one day in my uniform and I got my paper that says I don't have to be here anymore, and then I left. And the first you know the first couple weeks you're just glad to be out of the routine of it but then you start then you start to become idle and you're like okay well you know i i lived a life where i'm always doing something i'm always productive or i'm always working towards something and i always had somebody telling me what that was now you have to kind of find it for yourself and some guys you know some people just get lost in it some people can transition well other people struggle with it. Uh, it really just comes down to that that individual and how prepared they were when they got out. Uh, for myself, you know, I I don't know. It's just kind of I was able to find a, a decent job when I got out, and then it's kind of transitioned back into you know just being a guy. Um, his follow-up question from is eight years later. What do you look back on and remember the most? Uh, one good, one bad, and one funny. Uh, so they're they're all funny. Uh, <laughs> the, the the thing is, okay, so so 
like about that time that you get out of the military, you, you remember you, everything that sucks. You, you know it crystal clear. You're like, I, I hate standing in, you know, I hate standing in formation. I hate, I hate waiting to be released. I hate that everything that you know that you hate about it is just right there on, on the tip of your tongue. And then as you get out and the years go by, that starts to fade away where all you remember now is the good times and you almost get to the point like you know what i would go back oh, and then no. you then, until you're then scrubbing you, the floors again and then you have to you have to take a break and then go back and look at like old photos and stuff and then remember how bad that it actually sucked <laughs> uh yeah I, the, the the best part about it was it just the all the great people you know that i got to work with and and fight alongside of i mean that's just awesome. I got to meet so many great people. Uh, funny things. Uh, I would, <laughs> like I said, I got the the weekend at Bernie's story and in, in Iraq, but I, I'm not. I can't tell that one. That's, that's fine. I don't want anybody uh, getting that, a UCMJ or anything that, like that, that. that. That's that's a personal one that I keep for myself. Uh, but no, in in the books, there's all sorts of uh, of good light humor times because you'll find that that veterans, uh, especially combat veterans, have a very a very humorous look at at the world. I mean, yeah, I mean, they got that dark sense of humor. Yeah, it's and sometimes it can be extremely dry, uh, but it it's I mean, it's it's a coping mechanism. I mean, if if you're not dying, it's got to be funny. Um, let's see here. What else do I got? Uh, this one is from uh, Mr. Bruce. What is your most memorable strike that you've called in? Uh, I would have to. I, I love JDAMs. I just, I just love the way that they're employed. Uh, like one of my favorite aircrafts is a B1 Lancer. Uh, Understandable. Carries a lot of bombs. Uh, yeah, I, I would have to say. Okay, so, so I, I dropped a, a two thousand pounder on delay on a building and <laughs> okay so so there's like there's like a courtyard so it's a compound there's a courtyard and then there's a building next to it and we're taking fire from this this compound and I think it was, I think that one was a 500 pounder it, it had a 500 pounder on delay so basically it it landed in the courtyard it punched into the ground so it, it detonated in the ground. Uh, so the blast basically like lifted the inside of the courtyard up, and <laughs> and there's like there's like two or three dudes in the courtyard that that were shooting at us. Un unfortunate for them, I'm these, sure. These guys, these guys. It was the first time I, I'd actually ever seen like anybody get thrown. Like literally, like you saw, right? Like a you saw doll. their bodies. Yeah, they're basically like cartwheeling <laughs> out of out of the compound. That would have been awesome. Uh, to see. You see all sorts of weird stuff, man. Um, uh, but that's good. Yeah, I I like J dams. Uh, and I I got to drop a lot of those. Uh, those are always, they're always a good time because they're they're just they're absolute precision, and it's a lot of ordnance. Uh. So you can do a lot. You can do a lot of damage with them. Uh, I've got somebody asking, "What was your favorite aircraft to control?" And is there any aircraft that you didn't control that you wish you did? Uh, like I said, B one Lancers are are my favorite. Uh, also, uh, a ten close unmanned. second. Uh, yeah, eight eight ten. I I mean, each aircraft is is good at what it does. Uh. A tens are, are good when you're are really good when you're in a pinch and you're and you're you're close to the enemy. So so really close air support. Uh, AC one thirty gunships are just oh, they're just there. They're just good for like wrecking shop. Uh, but if you're trying to collect like intel and stuff like that, nothing beats unmanned aircraft. Uh, you know, just because of the camera and how long they can stay in the air. Right. So real so really the airframe has to fit what it is you need it to do or, or whatever the situation is. So they all they all have their you know, they all have their, their, their special things they do. Yeah, I've been reading about drones now, like some of these new drones that we're coming up with, where the battery life in them, they can stay up in the air for like a day at a day at a time without having to refuel. 
it's the future, man. It's I mean, crazy. it's 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 only gonna get it's only get gonna get more advanced. Um, are there any like European aircraft that you kind of wish you got to toy around with? <laughs> or... I know you uh, had, I had this issue with the mirages in your, in your book. Yeah, uh, I, the the Mangustas, uh, so the kind of like the Apache helicopter of uh, of the Italians. Uh, they're pretty good to work with. It, it's just it's hard working with NATO if the pilot doesn't speak very good English. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Uh, so so regardless of, of the airframe, uh, just the employment of it. It becomes watered down because you can't. The communication's not, uh, not as good. Like I would never like somebody that can barely speak English, and I'm not 100% sure he understands what I'm saying. Like that's not my go-to guy to drop like a ton of ordnance within like, you know, 300 meters from me. Um, somebody's asking, are there any questions you wish people would ask you that nobody's asked you before? That is a good question. Uh, a question that somebody's never asked me that I wish they would ask me. You know what? I've, I've, I've done so many interviews and, and gotten so many so many really good questions that, that, that kind of caveat in, into other things. Uh, I, I just, in general, I just like uh, when I get to talk, when people ask me, you know, about my relationship with other people like like when i get to talk about the guys on the team that's what i was going to actually follow up and ask you with is like do you still yeah, keep in contact to... with everyone and oh yeah yeah i mean most most of the guys that, that you know they've all gotten out of the military and moved on but no we're all we're all still close matter of fact awesome uh, uh the last time we were all together was they unveiled an exhibit at the marine corps museum marine corps at quantico museum, right I was I've uh, I've seen that exhibit actually. I've seen your uh, your stuff in there. Yeah, so so some of the, so they you know they got some of the team stuff in there and we all met up for that and it's That's just really it's, cool. it's 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 great because we I can go 2 years without seeing, you know, like George or or Mark or someone, but as soon, as soon as we get together it's like, you know, it's like old it's times. Like I, yep. It's instant and it's a uh, we're, we're just really fortunate that we've stayed in touch. That's awesome to hear. That really is cool that you guys still have that connection. Um, I guess one of the last questions here is, uh, what are you watching on Netflix right now? Oh, let's see, Netflix. Uh, so I work a lot, and I don't have, I don't have a lot of time to sit around and watch shows. Like I, I, I have a couple go-to shows that I, if I have, you know, when I eat my Captain Crunch in the morning, <laughs> I'll usually Solid watch. Choice. I'll usually watch like Parks and Rec. That's good. Uh, which, which that was just a. A, a dovetail from watching The Office, right. but I think that the last series I actually sat down and was watching was uh, uh, Westworld. Oh, great show! And, Absolutely and great show. I know, and I and and I've been meaning to get back into the second season, but you know, it's it's one of those things where I I've got to like I've got to like block out time right. to actually sit down and enjoy because because those they're, they're certain the series have gotten so good these days that you can't just kind of just jump in and out of them. You have to like devote yourself to them. Have you uh, have you seen the Punisher at all? I have not. Punisher's pretty good. Uh, I, mean, I know you being in the military would probably be like, well, that's not how this works, but suspend the disbelief a little bit. But that's a good show. I uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I've been watching. I watch weird shit on Netflix, like uh, Age of Tanks. It's like a documentary on the history of tank warfare. See, I love I love history stuff. Uh, you should check out Age of Tanks. It's, it starts from World War One. All the way up to the Iraq War. It's very good. It's like four episodes, hour long each. I I've enjoyed it. Um. All right. I think that's it. Um. Ski, thank you for sitting down and doing this with me. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate the time. And um, that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks again. All right. Thanks again for having me. Hey, no problem.